Welcome everyone, I'm Shreb Kadda, Editor-in-Chief of Globe Asia Magazine. Indonesia's host the World Economic Forum 2015 here in Jakarta. We are broadcasting live from the Shangri-La Hotel in Jakarta at a Berita Satu media session in partnership with the World Economic Forum. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world with a population of 250 million people. 60% of, of these Indonesians are under the age of 30. Indonesia also has one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Over the past decade or so, the economy has expanded by an average of 6.5% six, six per annum. It has a fast rising middle class. Today, there are 45 million Indonesians who are aspiring to enter the middle class. And, over the, and by the year 2030, that number will have doubled. It has a vibrant democracy. In October last year, Indonesians went to the polls to directly elected, elect their president for the third time in history. These are, these are exciting times for Indonesia. Indonesians today are, are expecting more and more from their government and from their organizations and leaders. But there are daunting challenges from solving gridlock, uh, traffic gridlock to raising educational standards, from creating better paying jobs to delivering a higher standard of living. Today, Indonesians want and demand to have a higher, uh, a world, uh, first class uh, standards. Joining us today in our discussion, which is titled Aspirations for an Inspirational Indonesia, I am happy to have a very distinguished panel uh, which I will introduce now. On my immediate left is Pabudi Gunadin Sadikin, uh, executive, Chief Executive Officer of Bank Mandiri, uh, Indonesia's largest bank. Welcome, pa, and thank you for joining us. Um, Professor Kishor Mabubani, Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Happy to have you here. Pak Marsudi Suhud Sahudi, General Secretary of Nadatul Ulama, Indonesia's largest Muslim-based organization with 85 million uh, members. Selamat datang, Pak. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hans Paul Buchner, Chairman of the Boston Consulting Group. Last but not least, Amanda Putri Widarmono, founder of We The Teachers. Thank you all for being with us. Let us get directly into the source of the discussion, the heart of the discussion. Amanda, if I may start with you, you're the baby amongst us. <laughs> um, you represent the future of Indonesia, uh, and you're, of course, running an organization which I think is very critical to the future of Indonesia, which is uh, um, you know, helping Indonesians to enter the teaching profession. profession. Maybe from your perspective as a young Indonesian, what are your aspirations? And what is your organization doing uh, to meet this aspiration of a better education? I think the aspiration for all human beings in general is to be full and to be full in many aspects. The first one, of course, is the stomach full, that we are not hungry, that we're not living in poverty. And then number two is that the brain is full, that we are fully equipped with skills and knowledge to tackle the challenges and the reality. And then number three, the wallet is full, that we are economically capable to sustain um, a decent, uh, proper lifestyle. Now, with regards to the teachers, we are working in the education sector. And what is the hope in terms of education sector? I think right now the standards um, needs to be reshaped and honed uh, really into something that is sharper. Now there are two sides here. Number one is to understand where Indonesia is going and to see the needs that Indonesia has. And of course to provide linear solutions through the education system, through the formal schooling system. But then we also cannot forget the roots of Indonesian values. Because we live in a world where everything is so hyper-connected we are over flooded, flooded by information, and it's so easy to lose ourselves in just the many, many pieces of uh, anecdotes that we face every day. And um, it is crucial to really emphasize and highlight 
those values of why we are here as a nation. So basically, it's you know uh, balancing the old and the new, the past and the future. Um, if I can move to Pak Budi, um, as the head of the country's largest bank, uh, of course, um, you know your bank is all uh, is critical to meeting one aspiration of the Indonesian people, which is, um, you know, hopefully a better standard of living and providing access to financial, uh, you know, to the financial system, because a large percentage of Indonesians still do not have access to credit, which I think hand, him, uh, uh, hinders them. In your view, how critical is this and what is your bank doing uh, to create greater access to the credit markets? You know, Indonesian Bank has been here for 350 years when the Duchess is, is uh, occupying Indonesia. And during 350 years, only 60 million Indonesian have bank accounts. So you can calculate easily if you want to fulfill 240 million Indonesian to have financial access, we will need another 1,050 years. <laughs> 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 of course, then we shouldn't do that because there is another industry, example, the telecommunication industry. I remember I first having my mobile handphone in 1994. So in 20 years until last year, they successfully penetrated 200 million of Indonesians. So if we can, we, if we can piggybacking on that industry, telecommunication industry, I think we can accelerate the penetrations of Indonesian people. But talking about Indonesia, Indonesia is very unlucky because we have many financial crises since 1998. But the other hand, we are also very, very lucky because we have the most bankers, we have the most regulators, we have the most finance ministers that still live and doing the same job and have real hands-on experience in handling crises compared to many other countries. And I remember the last major crisis in 1998 where people told me, Budi, you have nothing left on your right side of your balance sheet <laughs> and you have nothing right in your left side of your balance sheet is <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I can tell you, Indonesia survived in 2002 mining crisis, 2005 ma uh, mini crisis, and also major crisis in 2008. Because there is also one, you know, lucky things for any Indonesian uh, that, that we should understand. During bad times, Indonesians make good policies. But of course, during good times, usually we make bad policies. <laughs> but th th that's why we need only sometimes uh, bad times in Indonesian history. But I'm very positive and optimistic about Indonesia. In the next uh, 15 years, 50 million of Indonesians will enter middle class. For you that understand 50 million, it is larger than population of South Korea. Yes. It's slightly below the population of Thailand. So can you imagine in the next 15 years, one Thailand demand will be there. 50 million, one Thailand population will need saving account, will need credit card, will need car loan and mortgages. So that is a good business for, for me as a banker. And again, the last thing why you should feel optimistic and positive Im about Indonesia in the future, you see Pak Marsudi and me is the present of Indonesia. If you want to see the future of Indonesia, you see Amanda. <laughs> That's why she's here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, you know, I think uh, Indonesians are, are, are well known for being very mobile savvy. And in fact, in fact, in even uh, a bit crazy, they, you know, they call it mobile crazy in Indonesia. Um, and like, as you rightly said, there are 200 million subscribers uh, of, of handphones in Indonesia, you know. Uh, but for the banking system, you know, you will have to develop uh, mobile apps and you'll have to develop the system of, um, you know, channeling those funds to the people. Is that, is that happening now? It is like campaigning my banks, but uh, thank you for asking the questions. <laughs> 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 so we are very lucky that last year we are being asked by the Indonesian government to distribute the, the conditional cash transfer to millions of Indonesians. At that time, we are being offered to deliver 15.5 million, but because it, the system is new, we only take 1 million of Indonesians for conditional cash transfer. And conditional cash transfer is one of the bootstrap in every country, the history, if you want to do financial inclusion activity, because that will take the most. I just came back from World Bank uh, yesterday explaining the same things. And, I, I, and we put our commitment that between now until 2020, Mandiri will include 50 million of Indonesians financially inclusive. 
that align with the World Bank commitment, the president of the World Bank want, want to commit until 2020, 2 billion of the populations of the world will be financially inclusive. Just to share with you again the numbers, now it's only 60 million. And I can share with you, even Indonesian that have access to smoke, to cigarette, it's more than 60 million. So now the smoking inclusion of Indonesia is actually <laughs> slightly better than financial <laughs> inclusion. Well, that's not such a good number. But anyway, <laughs> Professor uh, Mahubani, maybe if I can turn to you. Uh, you have written exclusively and broadly on Asia and, of course, the, the broader trends uh, that are impacting the global environment. Um, while Indonesia, I think, is, is very upbeat and uh, there is great uh, pot uh, positive energy coursing through this nation, um, from your perspective, um, is democracy enough? Is, is, is that enough to, if, to get Indonesia to the next level? Yeah, you, you want to ask me the most difficult question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, let me begin by saying if uh, Amanda is the baby of the group, I'm the orang tua. <laughs> I'm the old man uh, of this group. So uh, speaking as the old man of this group, let me give a bit of uh, historical perspective here because I think what many outside observers don't get about Indonesia is how remarkably resilient uh, Indonesia is uh, uh, as a country because I actually was around when Indonesia went through the wrenching 1997-98 uh, financial crisis and all the international observers were saying, oh, Indonesia is finished, you know, it's going to, the economy will collapse, it will fall apart, it will become a Yugoslavia. Right. You know, I was in Belgrade two weeks right. ago, you know, and I saw what happens when a country falls apart. And here it's remarkable that you have, 15 years later, one of the most optimistic countries in the world in Indonesia today. And that shows what I call inner resilience, deep strengths in the society, uh, which I think will carry Indonesia uh, uh, forward uh, in the future. But at the same time, the, there's also a danger uh, of Indonesia becoming complacent. And here, the, I think the best thing, when you in, in response to your question, uh, is democracy enough? Let's look at the two other democracies that are large in the world. There's India, which is the world's largest democracy. And if my statistics are correct, I think Brazil is the next largest democracy after Indonesia. And if you look at these countries, you can see very clear and very powerful lessons that come from these countries. In the case of India, they tried Nehruvian socialism and went nowhere. And finally decided that the only way to succeed is to open up your economy and compete with the rest of the world. And in the case of Brazil, if there are any Brazilians in the room, please accept my apologies. <laughs> I'm going to say something very undiplomatic here. You know, Brazil has always been described as the land of tomorrow and will always be the land <laughs> of tomorrow. <laughs> and why? Because the Brazilians psychologically believe that the domestic market is so big it's the biggest Latin America, so let's protect our market, keep it to ourselves, and we'll succeed and do well. And you can see they're struggling. And you know, the, the lessons of the last 30 years, and the you know, we have seen far more economic growth and development in the last 30 years than the past 300 years. And you, the middle class statistics you gave, you want the middle class statistics for Asia, for all of Asia, the middle class is gonna go from 500 million in 2010 to 1.75 billion in 2020, which is only five years from now. So uh, obviously Indonesia can be part of a much larger wave of growth and development in Asia. But for that to happen, the lesson is very clear. You have to keep on opening up your economy and keep on engaging the world. And I was struck by your courage, uh, Fabudi, in saying that in bad times, Indonesia made good decisions. <laughs> in good times, Indonesia made bad decisions. Because I can, I can see the temptation in this country. I can see the temptation to say, hey, we are a country of 240 million, we can grow on our own. But you know, economic history is very clear. The reason why China has gone from having less than 10% of the United States GNP in PPP terms to exceeding the United States in 2014 last year was because, the United States, because China opened up and engaged the rest of the world. So my answer to you is democracy is not enough. 
you have to open up your economy and engage the rest of the world because the young people in Indonesia, I think, can compete with the rest of the world. Thank you. Uh, Hans, if I can just pick up on that yeah. point uh, on um, being open and remaining open to stay competitive. Um, you know, you travel around the world, uh, and I think you've just told me that you've just come back from Washington. Uh, what is the global perspective on Indonesia today? And from, your, from where you sit, you know, maybe what, if you can maybe tell us one or two key challenges that Indonesia needs to overcome. Yeah. Well, first I would like to, to follow up on, on what Professor Kishore has said about opening up. And it's not just opening up to foreign uh, players, to foreign investments, but I think really creating a level playing field within a country so that it's open to everybody who wants to engage you know, small comp uh, companies, you know, no new entrepreneurs and so forth, rather than keeping uh, certain sectors, certain businesses to a few or a handful of businesses which are well entrenched. Because I think that is really so important. I think opening up has not just an international dimension, it has really a domestic dimension too. Because then it really creates the opportunity for competing and competition is, even though it's a bit I would say awkward for everybody uh, individually. I think it's very good for society and for the economy at large. And I think we need to keep this into perspective when we talk about opening up, when we ask for more competition, that we're not always thinking about, oh my goodness, we have to protect ourselves against the foreigners. Opening up has a very strong domestic dimension, I think. Now, uh, going back to, to um, what you've emphasized uh, before, I mean, there is, of course, a lot of expectations towards mm. Indonesia, Southeast Asia in general. I think Southeast Asia uh, is, together with China and uh, India, the, uh, one of the three fastest growing regions in the world. And that's why there is enormous dynamic, but also the expectations are enormous. Obviously, the uh, ASEAN economic community raises even more expectations. And I think uh, uh, people do hope that all the countries, in particular Indonesia, will really push for that. Um, now, in order to make that true, uh, in order to really make good use of uh, the larger region, it's very important, and I think that goes back to what Amanda said at the beginning, of course, to develop talent. Mm. I think this is the biggest um, opportunity and the biggest need, uh, and really to invest in all levels of, uh, of education, primary, secondary, tertiary, but also uh, develop vocational training, uh, and making sure that people really can earn a living and really can create and shape their own destiny and that of their families. I think that's very important. The second, of course, everybody talks about infrastructure, a big challenge uh, for, uh, for Indonesia, not just for Indonesia, I think for Southeast Asia and of course for, for the rest of the world. Uh, many countries are struggling to make that work. I think a lot has to be done. And again, I think the issue is not, uh, is there, uh, and, uh, a lack of, of understanding of, of the needs, yeah, absolutely, I think everybody talks about it, but how can you make this work? How can you make uh, use of the land? Um, how can you, uh, on the one hand, uh, protect the rights of, of people, at the same time make sure that really progress is being happening, uh, so that not every highway, every port, airport, what have you, is really getting stuck into years, maybe even decades of <coughs> of uh, you know, litigation in, in courts and so forth, which is happening, I think, outside China, that's a big issue almost everywhere. And I would say, I think the, the third uh, big um, uh, challenge and opportunity is to make sure that there are strong institutions. Um, and uh, of course, it's, it's again in education, but it's also government institutions in, in general, making sure that there is really, the rule of law can prevail, that there is a level playing field, that people can really um, de depend on uh, government processes, on good processes. And I think we have seen already over the last uh, few months with the new government quite a number of activities to make that work. Um, but of course, a lot more uh, needs to be done. I think in general, very good um, uh, progress, a lot of expectations, and I'm very optimistic um, that things will uh, move forward here in Indonesia and in Southeast Asia overall. Thank you very much. I think you, you hit on a very good point is um, in, uh, trust in public institutions, which is very critical, I think, if Indonesia is going to move up. And if I can uh, use that as a, as a starting point for Pasahudi from NU. Uh, of course, NU is one of the 
you know, uh, oldest and, uh, you know, uh, most respected institutions in Indonesia. You have 85 million uh, members spread across the country. Uh, you know, your, your founders uh, fought in the battle for independence in Indonesia, so you have a rich history. But is NU today prepared for tomorrow? Yes, of course. <laughs> 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 NU is the biggest organization, not only in Indonesia, but in the world. We have ST uh, 5 million members. And we are, as Indonesian people, very, very lucky that we have an organization, not only a new organization. There is another organization like Muhammadiyah, Muhammadiyah, al Wasliya, and another. You can imagine a Muslim country, 12.9% total population Muslim in the world are in Indonesia. In Indonesia. 12.9% total Muslim in, in the world in Indonesia. And now every day we can see in the television, like in the Middle East, they are Muslim in Middle East, but they have not an organization like Indonesia. Like in Libya, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and other countries. Indonesia have a big organization that can make a balance when it happened a problem in the country. We have uh, more mini minister than the party have, and you have more minister than the party have. And also we have uh, people representative more than the party have. We have uh, governor, bupatis, and so on. That's why if any problem in this country, Indonesia, I just contact them. We can contact the members of NU who sit in Golkar Party. We can contact the members of NU in the Democrat, in the any other party. And then we can sit together in the office of Nahdlatul Ulama. And then we ask them, what is the problem? What do you want to be? What do you want to make Indonesia to the future. Uh, that's why Nadotul Ulama guarantee that Indonesia will be in peace and peace, growing and growing, insha'Allah. <laughs> like uh, most of the people, Muslim people in Indonesia, they ask to the government, they, they should give the policy like the values of their religion. The values of Muslim religion is tasarruful imam ala ro'yah manutun bil maslaha. The public policy for, from the government must be, or in the orientation must be for the people better and better. It must be. How to get there? To get there, uh, between the government and the people must be in connectivity. Mm. Connectivity <coughs> between the people and the government. If the government, if the people need, for example, uh, like in NTB or NTT, because uh, the harbor over there is not enough. So when we want uh, a cow, maybe just it will be uh, cheapest if we take from the Australia, because in NTT, island or NTB, uh, the harbor is not as big as enough. That's why that the government should give the policy tasaruful imam ala ro'yah manutun bi al maslaha. This is Islamic teaching. Connectivity between the program with the people need. Connectivity people, uh, between the program that the government want to make it the program should be connected with the island, one island and another island. Because Indonesia have 17 million island, Indonesia. And the total land in Indonesia, uh, the, tot the, 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 the area of Indonesia is 5 million 193 uh, thousand 250 kilometers. This is the Indonesia. And then the population 250 million, 
And now, uh, Indonesian people, of course, feeling increase and increase economic better and better, and insha'Allah, Indonesia will be the seven biggest countries in the world because we live together among others. Not only just Muslim as a majority, Nahdlatul Ulama. Also, we have another religion like uh, a Protestant is 6.9% and Catholic 2.6% and another religion, Hindus, Buddhists. But we are able to live together. We are able, if we have a problem, we can discuss one religion with other religion. We can sit together. This is maybe that another, another Muslim country cannot do like Indonesian countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you, you touch on a, in, uh, an important point, which is religious tolerance in Indonesia. Uh, of course, you know, I think uh, the broad spectrum of Indonesian society and everyday Indonesians would respect other religions, but there are minorities within Indonesia who don't. And at times, uh, those minorities unfortunately give Indonesia a bad reputation, uh, let alone you know, destroy property and take innocent lives. Um, Terrorism, of course, is a, it, uh, and uh, is, uh, militant Islam is, is, is a problem across the world. And I think it's an issue which uh, not just Indonesia, but many other countries are also grappling with in the region. Um, maybe on that point, but if I can come to Professor Kishore, how big is this threat? You always come to me with difficult questions. <laughs> 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 okay, well, first, uh, let me, I will answer your question, and, but let me, uh, I must say, reinforce a very key message that Pastor Hodi has made uh, about Indonesia's culture of tolerance and openness. I mean, it's it displayed every day. I mean, the fact is, if you look at Jakarta, uh, which is the capital of the world's, uh, you say, most populous Islamic country in the world, about 20 years ago, when you came to Jakarta, you couldn't see any Chinese writing on the wall. It was not allowed. But today, you have a Chinese governor of Jakarta. That's an amazing transition that the world hasn't uh, noticed. Yesterday, when I was driving around Jakarta, and I saw this wonderful statue, the Kuda Ramayana, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. The horses leading from a scene from Ramayana. And this is, again, the world's largest, uh, most populous Islamic country. You have this incredibly large statue in Ramayana, which I don't see in India, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So that's an example of the openness and, and, and tolerance of Indonesian yeah. society. Yeah. And frankly, I actually think that Indonesia's historic mission in the next uh, few decades is to be actually a role model for the rest of the Islamic world on how to be so open and tolerant uh, in dealing with other cultures and civilizations. I say this because I think on the one hand, it, like, let's take the ISIL threat. Mm. It is. Uh, dangerous, but it is still a small cancerous tumor. And that small cancerous tumor can be excised. It can be done. But what is worrying about ISIL is that if it just came from one or two countries, it would be a, a, a relatively small problem. But you know, it's what's amazing is that you have uh, young people educated in the United Kingdom speaking better English than I do, mm. uh, coming forth and running and joining this organization. You have Australians, you have Indonesians, mm. you have Malaysians, and it's amazing. So the question, therefore, which you have to ask is what are the deeper roots of this anger that drive these people to sacrifice their lives. And that one, I think, is an issue that the world hasn't handled well yet. So while we need to uh, uh, speak about the values of tolerance and openness and diversity, we also have to acknowledge that there are lots of young, angry people out there, and we have to try and address that challenge. And I think it's not going to be solved in the next one or two years. It will take for at least five to ten years. If I may just chime in, I think it's not just an issue of religious extremism. I think it's 
uh, extremism from the right, from the left, uh, and we have this in, in different shapes and forms around the world. Now, of course, it manifests itself at the moment, uh, particularly in the Middle East. Um, but I think, you know, going back to also what Professor Kishore said, I think the, the issue of extremism is usually people who have been marginalized mm. in, in their societies, yeah, one way or the other. Um, and, uh, or at least they feel they're perceived to be marginalized. Maybe objectively it may not be that case, but, but they perceive to be marginalized. It could be because of lack of, um, of education, lack of opportu economic opportunity, participation in society, and I think that is really the issue. Um, and that's why we have all over the Europe, we have uh, young people, young men, uh, and some women also joining uh, ISIS um, in, in, in Syria, in Iraq, uh, also from Germany, from France, and so forth. And I think that will be the key issue for us to make sure that people really participate. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you said earlier about inclusiveness has to do also with the opportunity to participate. And that means, you know, an open society that does not disenfranchise certain groups or that does not uh, um, uh, prevent certain groups from participating. And I think, again, you know, going back to the initial idea about openness, I think it is a much wider concept that has not just economic consequence, but also, I think, consequence in terms of how do people live together. Absolutely. Uh, Amanda, uh, you know, do you feel that Indonesia is growing increasingly open, an open society where people can share their views and, you know, participate, I think, in public life, be it, be it politics, be it economics, uh, be it religious, uh, that is not dominated by the elite, so to speak, you know? Do you get that sense? Certainly, I think technology has really democratized people's opinions, so everybody has a platform online to voice out their ideas and to be really vocal <laughs> about what they think. Now, with technology, you can talk and you can communicate and interact with each other, and it is also very um, easy to react instantly, to reply instantly, respond instantly, and that's part of the double-edged sword of technology. But this extremism, we could actually leverage this to really voice out positive messages. For instance, um, taking the example of the last presidential election, Indonesia was very polarized because you only had two candidates, and it was either or, and everybody became so vocal and so fluent in politics, including the young people in the short span period of time. So if we could use that extremism towards good causes, um, I think that could bring real tangible benefits to Indonesia, but that takes real commitment as well from the public institutions to build connections, to build relationships, and to really uh, help in shaping the mindset that we are an optimistic nation by nature, and also from other uh, sectors as well to help support um, this positive movement because we're very fluid and technology has helped us to really just connect with each other. Right, yeah. right. Um, I'm just going to ask one more question before I throw the uh, session open to the, to the audience. Uh, please uh, identify yourself. You can make a comment. Or you can ask a question or, you know, uh, you know, provide, you know, we don't want to monopolize the discussion uh, just up here. You know, we want everyone to join in. Um, but there was one question that I wanted to uh, direct to Pabudi first, uh, and that really is, you know, uh, in line with what she says, is about um, helping people uh, to get better paying jobs. And that, of course, we don't have a government minister on the panel, we, I wish we did, but uh, I, I'm going to throw that question to you. <laughs> um, so he's going to become a minister. <laughs> <laughs> he's leading that way. <laughs> no. But do you think, you know, um, all, you know, for, for many, many years, of course, you know, Indonesia has been a top-down type society, top-down type economy. Uh, but now you see a, a groundswell of a bottom-up push where people are demanding change and not waiting for the government and doing things on their own. Um, I know this is going to be a bit controversial, but do you think that going forward, um, is the government going to continue uh, stay as relevant to the direction that this country is going to take as it is today? Uh, first, the first time I, I entered a workforce, 
I remember in 1988, out of the 100% of total GDP of Indonesia, 60% was contributed by the central government during Suharto era. If you look back today, one trillion US dollar in terms of GDP, if you compare government budget, is less than 20%. So for me, it's very, very clear that the Indonesian economy, at least, was driven by the private sector more than the government. Yeah. And I'm very bullish. I'm, I'm very bullish on it. If, if you see all the poverty index, the unemployment index, it went down. It doesn't mean that there are, there are nothing that we can do better. There are, there are a lot of things that, that we can do better. And I'm, I'm again, I'm very, very optimistic because Changes are happen. Not many people and press take a view of the positive angle of it. Most of it take the negative angle of it. Like example, I just mentioned to you the extremism, the separatism. I think at the end of the day, it came down to anger, like what you said. In Indonesia, maybe we are not the richest country in the world. We are not the highest GDP per capita. But I remember there is some research talking about the happiness index. Mm. Indonesia is the most happiness country in the world. <laughs> Al although we are very, very poor, yeah. but we are very happy. <laughs> so it's very difficult for you to find extremism. S Singapore is rich and unhappy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes I, di I didn't say that. I, I, I didn't say that, but, but then I can follow up on that one. You know, the Gini coefficient of Indonesia is 0 0.41. Yeah. Many people understand about it, but not many people understand the Gini coefficient in Singapore is actually higher than Indonesia. Mm. So, so the tension there are, are, are bigger. And i just give you another example. United States is the most democratic country, many people say. You never see the woman president in the United States. Yeah. You, see, so you, you saw an Indonesian woman president. And you see, sitting in this room, all dominated by men. Yeah. Only Indonesian have a woman representative. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. I think the, the direction definitely is very up. positive. <laughs> um, are there any questions, uh, comments, uh, you know, observations? Yes, but yes. yes, sir. Please identify yourself. Yes. Yeah. My name is Sahala Gaul. Uh, I'm a special staff for the uh, state-owned enterprise minister, ah. uh, Mr. Rini Suwandi, uh, uh, Sumarno. Uh, I would like to make a comment about the openness of Indonesia. I think it's, uh, this is very important. Uh, we understand uh, our economy actually is, uh, is, I think, the most open economy in the world right now. Uh, we already have an uh, uh, agreement with uh, so many countries, uh, even uh, China, ASEAN, and also uh, China, Indonesia, and the other also, with the US also, the same thing with the other countries. But let me uh, explain about the Indonesian right now. We also try to open all of the Indonesia region to the economy. That's why it's very important to make the connectivity uh, in Indonesia economic. Uh, our state and enterprise, we like to be uh, an agent of economy, agent development uh, for this country. We like to build up uh, the port uh, surround of Indonesia, especially in Easter Park. Uh, now we start to building up that one from Sorong and then 25 uh, or 35 port in the eastern part of Indonesia. Uh, Besides that, I think it's our telecommunication company. Now it's already uh, finished uh, uh, building up al also the network in all of the Indonesia. Uh, and also we provide also infrastructure uh, because we believe uh, infrastructure is different. We have to supply infrastructure and then the demand will come. Uh, that's the idea. So we will open the potential economic uh, region to the world and also to the economy of Indonesia. Uh, electricity we provide uh, now for this all of the Indonesia. Uh, in this year, uh, five years uh, to come, we will uh, build up uh, 35,000 uh, megawatt electricity in all of the Indonesia. Now we do have uh, already uh, 50. Uh, 50,000 megawatts are ready for the economy. Also, we will build up also store road, we'll build up uh, industrial park in many, many Indonesia. In all of the island of Indonesia, potential uh, state-owned enterprise will build uh, industrial park. 
that's why I think it's a Indonesia is ready uh, to grow and then also to face the challenge for the future. We will provide uh, the openness of potential region in Indonesia and also to the company. We invite the private to participate. It's not just Indonesian local uh, uh, company, but also international. And state-owned enterprise will happy to join with all of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, sir. And Mandiri is state-owned enterprise, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we have a mic on this side? Sato Hi, my name is Sato Hiro Akimoro with Mitsubishi Corporation. I have a question to Ms. Uh, Professor Mabani. Good to see you again. Uh, my question is with regard to Indonesia's role in ASEAN. Uh, assuming that uh, uh, ASEAN needs leadership uh, uh, among different countries, uh, obviously, uh, uh, ASEAN is a looser uh, coalition of uh, uh, countries as compared to a uh, uh, group of a country like the EU. But uh, uh, do you think uh, uh, as uh, Indonesia is playing a role, leadership role in ASEAN, as comparable to all the nice quality that uh, Indonesia has inside, as well as a uh, 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 weight of economy, weight of uh, 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 democracy that uh, uh, it has uh, in the region? Uh, thank you. Well. <laughs> I seem to you get all the get difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, let, me, let me begin by emphasizing one fact. Huh? The, uh, I'm actually, going to, I'm by actually, my next book is going to be on ASEAN, and I, the, the, I'm going to say the title of my book is that it's Southeast Asia, the most blessed corner of the earth. And actually, it's amazing what ASEAN has accomplished in delivering peace and prosperity to the Balkans of Asia. And people have, th they have no idea how much worse off this region could have been if ASEAN had not uh, succeeded, you know. So we have accomplished a lot. But I think that at the same time, uh, to be very candid, uh, 2015 is a very critical year for ASEAN. Because as you know, this is the year when we are supposed to launch, uh, among other things, uh, the ASEAN Economic Community. And I can tell you the whole world is watching very carefully how ASEAN will do in this area. Now, we, you know, I was a former diplomat. I was a diplomat for uh, 33 years. And I can guarantee you that the ministers at the end of the year will stand up and dec declare victory and say, yes, we have established an ASEAN economic community. 85% uh, of the products are now tariff-free, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, it's not what you say that's important. It's what the markets believe that's important. So what, what I agree with you that Indonesia is, uh, uh, it is, I agree with you, it is a very uh, uh, open economy. But at the same time, when I talk to several Indonesian businessmen, businesswomen, I get the feeling that there is the sort of growing trend towards economic nationalism in Indonesia. It hasn't surfaced yet in terms of policies, but it is a real sentiment that is growing uh, in this country. And if that sentiment enters policy making into Indonesia, then Indonesia might provide the brakes on the AEC, which would be very bad for ASEAN, and, and, and so by the way, also very bad for, for Indonesia. Indonesia. And so my, my advice to all the ASEAN countries, not just Indonesia, all the ASEAN countries is fortunately, when you talk of openness and transparency and so on and so forth, there are now hundreds of indexes around the world. The World Economic Forum produces wonderful index on competitiveness. Now, if uh, the ASEAN countries want to tell the rest of the world, hey, we are open and competitive, please declare your number mm. on the World Economic Forum Competitiveness Index because that's ob objectively done. And if you don't move your country up that index, after you declare the ASEAN economic community, then you have to ask yourself, was that good enough a job? And that's why I think the next six months, by the way, are very critical six months for ASEAN. And I hope that uh, as in the past, the leadership will emerge. And traditionally, I mean, let's be honest about this. Indonesia is the largest country within ASEAN. Indonesian leadership is very critical for the success of ASEAN. So if Indonesia can come forth and push for a stronger ASEAN economic community, then it would be an amazing result. 
but it's not just this year. I think it's it's the next yeah. five, ten, fifteen years. I think the, the the community will be built over many years. I think mm. we should we should not just focus too much on this one year. Quite honestly. But le uh, let let me continue because I strongly believe the Asian economy community so far has been a discussions at the political government or business elite. Mm. We should continue not to only discuss this at the elite level, but we have to bring this down to the grassroots, to the people level. So far what I notice, it is discussions at the brain level that people talk about this intellectually, mm -hmm. like the professor, you know, the, the political elite, but we are not bring this to the heart and talking about this passionately. And I think one major component that many people forget, and our founding fathers of ASEAN put it clearly in ASEAN economic community principle, which is I totally agree, but we spend less time to discuss about this. ASEAN economic community is talking about single market and production mm -hmm. base. Everybody is talking about this. Talking about uh, global competitiveness, everybody is talking about this. But there is one item that people almost forget. Equitable economic development. And less people in ASEAN talking about this. Because I just uh, put you some figures uh, from uh, Thomas Piketty. Back in 1820, the gap between the rich and poor is 3 to 1. In 1950, the gap of rich and poor is 35 to 1. In 2014, the gap rich and poor is 80 to 1. And history, scientifically proven, you can only reduce it either with revolutions, French Revolution, Russian Revolution, or World War, World War I, World War II. I think we have to put a clear intention that the rich country like Singapore and Malaysia wholeheartedly, passionately try to bring Indonesia and Vietnam or other country mm. closer to them. If the focus is to make us bigger, that will create unsustainability. That will happen in Europe. Because the rich country will come richer, the poor country stay poor, and it will not create sustainability. I am a strong believer if you want to create ASEAN as a move forward, a very solid economic group, then focus on equitable economic development as one of the pillars that our founding fathers in ASEAN aside is something that we have to focus on. That I think is uh, very well put, you know. Uh, any other comments or questions? Well, uh, I think we should. Yes. We should yeah. uh, go so ahead first. But I think we should not forget that actually income distribution across the world has improved over the last 20 years. Even though within countries, income distribution has gotten worse. In, in many countries, I think around the world, because of the enormous development in the emerging markets, uh, the world has become more equal uh, despite all the uh, discussion around it.